is deadly. Trinitarios know how to work with machetes and fight with them. They will just cut your head and that's it. They're not just want to do a little assault on you. They want to pull you six feet under. They don't shoot their victims. They butcher them. The whole arm could come on. The leg, wherever they hit you at, is gone. They are the Trinitarios, one of New York's most lethal and fastest rising gangs. You kill somebody with a gun, you ain't nothing. But if you kill somebody with a knife, I mean, you're real. Filled with some of the world's most familiar landmarks. Broadway. The Empire State Building. The Statue of Liberty. New York is very, very big. You have the business district, the financial market. And New York has a shower law for everybody. Far less welcoming is a group of outlaws that call New York City home. A brutal gang, more than a thousand strong, with roots in the Dominican Republic. They are the Trinitarios. Their goal is to dominate America's largest city. The Trinitarios, they always want to be on top. They want to be on top of blood. They want to be on top of kings. They want to be on top of nietas. They got to be on top always. The Trinitarios were born and bred in the New York City prison system. Now, they're spreading across the city's five boroughs and creeping into nearby Hudson County, New Jersey. They feel the heat in New York and then they come over here. Or if they've committed a crime and they wanted to get away, they'll hide away over here in New Jersey. They've built their violent reputations, wielding a simple but grisly weapon. They don't go out there and shoot people. They're mostly machetes. They're slashing people, cutting people. You hit them and you put it back, it brings everything out. Blade, a high-ranking Trinitario in one of the New Jersey chapters, fears retaliation for speaking out about the gang. He asked to have his identity concealed. Blade came to the United States from the Dominican Republic in 1993 when he was 13. First month when I was over here, I stabbed my sister in the arm because she was trying to smack me. It wasn't his first assault. Blade already had a violent reputation. I stabbed somebody in the heart. I was, I was like 11 years old because he was trying to take my sneakers. Blade and his family settled in Jersey City, across the Hudson River from Manhattan. It was a tough adjustment. I didn't speak English when I came over here. And when I used to go to school, I used to get jumped every day. If I, everybody basically. Blade joined the Trinitarios and quickly made his own reputation. The leader of a Latin king went to the Kamar block and he threw me a punch. So when he did that, I pulled out the machete. I hit him in the head. Then I hit him like four, four more times in the arm because he went like that. He got like a lot of stitches. He got like 50 something stitches in, in, in his head. That kind of one-on-one -on -one brutality has shocked even hardened New Jersey cops like Davis Valdivia. A machete, I'm gonna take a limb off. Uh, Depending where I swing it, if I swing it at your neck, I'm going to take your neck off. 
For years, he's seen firsthand how the Trinitarios get up close and personal. Well, with a gun, you can, you can shoot somebody from far away and not even see the person. To stab someone, you gotta get up and close and, and really to stick somebody. But assaults aren't the gang's only crime. They're definitely in, in, in the drug business. They're definitely in the home invasion business. Assaults, robberies, uh, you know, they run the gamut, just like any other super gang. The Trinitarios have turf all over the Bronx and the Washington Heights section of Upper Manhattan. Washington Heights is home to many Dominican immigrants and is a transportation hub. Six bridges, three highways, and three tunnels are nearby, all allowing for quick access to the entire metropolitan area. It's the perfect setup for drug dealers and gang members on the run, making it difficult for law enforcement to track them. Okay, I just received information um, from one of my guys that uh, uh, the person that we um, that is doing the hand-to-hand -hand transaction uh, is coming towards our area now. Thanks to the easy access between New York and New Jersey, the Trinitarios have a lucrative narcotics business in both states. It's so easy to travel from one one place to another that if they have a problem with the law enforcement, they'll move to another spot. Well, number one, he, he's selling drugs on the street, so um, he got to go. He's selling cocaine. They could make about 10, 15,000 a day. They doing drugs. They selling drugs. If you owe them money, they're going to kill you. This gang member, Loco, has also asked to have his identity concealed. Loco began hanging with the Trinitarios when he was 16. I was attracted to them by the way that they used to hang out. Money and girls, they used to drink. If you didn't have money, they would have given you money to eat, to get whatever you want. He ran into trouble with the law when a brawl broke out at one of their parties. Well, some three from New York came and stopped the guy five times. And from that time, we all got out of Loco found himself behind bars for six months in the Hudson County Jail. His cellmates were all hardened gang members, and Loco had to make a life-or-death decision. When I went to jail, it was so crazy because I wasn't a member of a gang. I had to make a choice. Or I'll be neutral and I get beat up, or I'll become Trinitario. Loco joined the Trinitarios. You got to fight for respect. If you don't fight for respect inside, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get killed. Though New York authorities have battled the Trinitarios for years, the gang has flown under the radar of New Jersey PD. We weren't aware of them. We heard rumblings of them. We heard the names being thrown around. But we didn't know who they were or what they were about. But a savage crime would change everything. August 24th, 2003, Union City. Trinitarios from all over northern New Jersey joined thousands who lined the streets for the annual Dominican Independence Day Parade. It's supposed to be a joyous occasion, and it's supposed to be fun for all the family and for all, everyone who's Dominican. Police were also on alert for gang activity, which had arisen in years past. And the number of people who attend the parade with the idea that they should be proud of being who they are and 
sometimes who they are are gang members. Detective Davis Valdivia was on a routine assignment to tape surveillance video from a rooftop near the end of the parade route. The stakeout was strictly a precaution. I just would zoom in on people's faces and uh, later on try to identify them. Uh, if something should happen in the future, we have informants throughout Union City and we can go to them and show them the tape and try to get people ID'd. Four months earlier, tensions between the New Jersey Trinitarios and one of their rivals, a fierce street gang called the 60th Street Boys, had ended in bloodshed. They were arguing possibly about a girl when a member of the Trinitarios pulled a knife. One of the 60th Street Boys took the knife away and pretty brutally stabbed a member of the Trinitarius. The victim survived, and the attacker was arrested. But the New Jersey Trinitarios had yet to exact their revenge. Now, as the parade wound through the streets, Detective Valdivia scanned the crowd with his camera. Suddenly, some new faces caught his attention. There were some individuals in, in the group that I'd never seen before. Um, and I zoomed in on them. The new gang members turned out to be Trinitarios from New York. Four months had passed since the 60th Street stabbing, and the New York members were angry that their New Jersey crew hadn't retaliated. The guy from New York that was like, and you haven't done nothing? So we gonna do something. They kill anybody and they don't care. They had to do this to let everyone know that this is what happens to you when you mess with the Trinitarius. The Trinitarios confronted the 60th Street Boys, but they weren't about to go down without a fight. They challenged the Trinitarios to settle the beef after the parade. The 60th Street local gang um, basically says, if you want some of this, you know where to find us. The Trinitarios were ready for battle. They met in a nearby schoolyard and planned their revenge. They would execute a coordinated attack on the 60th Street boys, on 60th Street, on their own turf. What happened next would put the New Jersey Trinitarios on the map. They definitely made a name for themselves that day. They gotta respect our parade, and they gotta respect our colors. And we're doing that, so we're going after them. City. It's the gateway to the United States. A symbol of opportunity, hope, and the American dream. It's also the breeding ground for a fast rising criminal enterprise that silences its victims with machetes. A Dominican gang called the Trinitarios. Trinitarios, they kill people, they rob people. They kidnap people. Yeah, they doing the money quick. The Dominican Republic is the second largest nation in the Caribbean. With a long history of hardship. In 1961, the country's harsh dictator, Rafael Trujillo, was assassinated. Ending his oppression, but throwing the country into chaos. For the next few decades, tens of thousands of immigrants fled to New York, all in search of a better life. They came here to the U.S., which at the time was experiencing a pretty decent manufacturing job market, and Dominicans came here to work. In the Dominican Republic, you only make 3,000 pesos a month. That's like $125. It sucks. <laughs> Nobody want to be there. 
by 1990, there were a quarter million Dominicans in the New York metropolitan area. Most were productive citizens, but some got caught up in the city's crack epidemic and violent underworld. Everybody want to be thugs and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So everybody's doing crime over here. The cops took action and Dominicans began streaming into the New York City correction system, including the notorious Rikers Island Penitentiary, just east of Manhattan. They quickly became the targets of violent, more established gangs, like the Bloods, Crips, and Latin Kings. Dominicans at the time were the minority. Many of them found themselves to be uh, abused by the other ethnic groups that were present. You see a lot of extortion in jail. People taking your commissary, people making you wash their drawers, beating you up for a phone call. In 1990, one Dominican inmate rebelled against the abuse. Pedro Nunez, a.k.a. El Caballon, was serving an 18-year sentence at Rikers for weapons possession. Bayon formed his own gang, Trinitarios, which means Trinity. He took the name from three revered leaders of the Dominican independence movement from Haiti in the 1840s. He saw the abuses that were occurring, and um, just like Duarte, Sanchez, and Mella saw that the Dominicans were being abused, he felt the same way and started uh, this group with the same name as the founding fathers of the Dominican Republic, the Trinitarios. For the first time, the Dominican convicts had protection under the Trinitarios. But the gang kept a low profile to escape the watchful eye of prison officials. They kept it very quiet about what was going on for obvious reasons. The Trinitarios on Rikers Island basically operate as a secret society that's there to protect uh, Dominicans. As their numbers grew into the hundreds, the Trinitarios began dominating the other gangs. I don't care what anybody said in New York, if you're not a Trini in jail, you're nothing. Ain't no blood, Crips, Latin King, nothing. Trini running you. El Caballon's domain expanded in the mid-1990s. As Trinitarios finished their time at Rikers and returned to the streets. With El Caballon running the gang from prison, the Trinitarios took new shape in the heavily Dominican neighborhood of Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan. So they started making like, if you're going to be a Trini in here, you got to represent Trini out there. And you're not just going to be a Trini in jail for protection. You got to be a Trini in the street too. You got to represent. The Trinitarios unleashed a crime wave that ran through Washington Heights into the Bronx and Brooklyn. They started doing um, narcotics distribution, possession of weapons, and uh, violent crimes. In 1995, in the Bronx alone, nearly a murder a day was occurring, thanks in part to the Trinitarios. The gang began smuggling cocaine from the Dominican Republic using ingenious and dangerous methods. They'll bring drugs to the state by, by swallowing it, boofing it. These carriers, known as mules, could hide a half pound or more of narcotics, risking death with each trip. Imagine you with more than 300 grams inside your stomach. Anything could go wrong. You can't eat, you can't you can't drink nothing. Jefe, a Dominican native, asked to have his identity concealed. He 
and his family moved to the Bronx in 1992. There's always something going on around there. Someone getting shot. Someone getting called for selling drugs. Pepe's father worked long hours driving a cab. He insisted Hefe stay at home while he was working because of the many gangs that terrorized the hood. It was usually bloods and crips. You know, they had Latin kings, they had nietas, Sulu nation. And you had a few gunshots. The gang violence was impossible to avoid. In 1998, the NYPD and Hefe's precinct recorded over 2,000 violent crimes, including rape, robbery, burglary, and murder. Well, it was dangerous. The 44 precinct is the busiest precinct in the Bronx. Hefe had to stick with his Dominican brothers for protection. It was a lot of race going on, race issue, Dominicans and blacks. Uh, they would come and pick up Dominicans on high school, junior high school, and we would just retaliate. By 1999, the Trinitarios had hundreds of members in New York City. And a brutal reputation that stunned even law enforcement. They had to go to the extreme to prove themselves to the other gangs that they could compete with them. Um, in the streets or drug sales. They attacked their rivals with machetes. Common weapons in the Dominican Republic, but rarely seen in this urban jungle. We used to carry a machete in our pants, our book bag, our sleeves. Wherever we could have fit it, we would have carried it. Armed, dangerous, and in control of New York, the Trinitarios were anxious to expand their territory. They found it right across the Hudson River. For years, New Jersey had attracted Dominicans who craved the advantages of the city, but with a lower cost of living. All it took was one Trinitario and New York's inner city gang epidemic spread like a virus into the suburbs of New Jersey. It started only by one person in Bayonne, and then from Bayonne, it got all the way up to Union City and West New York. The New York members began mentoring their New Jersey counterparts. They didn't have a structure at the moment, so they started helping them and teaching them how to do the stuff, how to sell their own guns, make, manufacture their own drugs. As the gang became more organized, so did its drug trade. The power of the Trinitarios was spreading fast. They go through the George Washington Bridge, so they transport the drugs from, from New York to Jersey City, and then from Jersey City, they spread it up north. New recruits were easily found in local high schools. Blade joined his sophomore year then dropped out of school to focus on his new family. When I became a trainer, it was all about taking care of people. You needed money for rent, we did. Like, nobody wanted to mess with Trini. Their ruthless use of crude, store-bought machetes made it even more obvious that the Trinitarios meant business. Loco witnessed one fight that drove the point home. So it was like King trying to fight with them. So I seen some guy that I just grabbed a machete and tried to cut up his arm. He hit him a few times, but his arm was falling down. Loco was inspired by the gang's fearlessness. The drug money was an added bonus. I used to sell drugs. I felt like I was doing something wrong, but I liked the money. By 2003, the Trinitarios had more than 100 members in northern New Jersey alone. Though the gang had long been in the sights of New York City PD, their growing numbers were still a secret across the Hudson. It would 
take a cold-blooded killing before New Jersey authorities got the message. And it was so quick. I mean, it was just like wildfire. They just started spreading all over Hudson County. The Trinitarios. A machete-wielding Dominican super gang in New York City is spreading its brutal violence into neighboring New Jersey. They were operating under the radar for a while before anybody got uh, to know who they were, really were and what they were about. Trinitarios take pride in their Dominican roots. It starts with their name. It comes from the word uh, Trinity, uh, from the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The gang's colors are those of the Dominican flag. Red, white, blue, and most significantly, lime green. The center of the flag, that green, it means like earth. That's why we represent green. If you're wearing green, you want the mine. They always carrying a green bandana, or a green scarf, or a green hat. Anything that they wear green, it shows that they are dreamers. The gang also uses the flag as the basis of their motto. If you look at the Dominican flag, you have three words on top. It says, Dios, Patria, and Libertad, which is God, country, and liberty. To recognize one another, members frequently greet each other with the numbers 41, 6, 12. 41, 6, 12 is to know if you a Trinitario, you'll be asked, you son of Dante? You say 41, 6, 12, like, yeah, I'm Trinitario. The numbers are a secret code that Trinitarios use to hide their identity. But it's really 4, 16, 12, which are the uh, respective locations for the D, P, and the L, and the alphabetical number. It's a code. So they'll make 4 and 16, 41, and 6. The letters D, P, and L show up in almost all of the gang's markings. Trinitarios aren't required to get inked. But those who do choose symbols of the motherland. Most of the Trinities, they do the Dominican flag, DPF, the Apatria Another popular tat is the symbol 3NI. 3 is for the three colors of our flag and the three fathers of our country. And an I is short for Trinitari. Trinitarios also represent with hand signs. There's two guns on. It's in the center of our flag. And that's the, the three fathers of our country, the three colors of our flag, and the Pio, the Opatri Libertad. That's the T for, for, for Trinix, and it's like a cross, because our flag has like a cross that divides the colors. The Trinitarios are highly organized and enforce strict rules. I want to say maybe second to the Latin Kings, they're probably uh, the, uh, the most structured gang. All of the gang's chapters are organized the same way. Trinitarian structure, everything is three. So there's three top, then you, you break it down into three heads for each chapter. They'll start off with uh, the, the head, which they call a cabeza. They'll have uh, a secretary. They'll have a treasurer. They'll have uh, security. They'll have um, an enforcer. There is even an advisor who handles the member's personal business. He's the one, like, if you have a problem, like with your family and stuff like that, you need somebody to talk to, you talk to him. Leaders who get busted are quickly replaced. If I get sent upstate, whoever's second is first, third is second, and third will be a new man, you know? Trinitarios initiate some recruits with beat-ins. 
Others just need a good recommendation from a trusted crew member. If they know you really put in work, you know you fight and all that, they will make you go through a hassle. And when they go, I know him, man, he, he gets down. All members must learn and obey the gang's basic code. The seven points. God, respect, love, peace, chorus, nation, and liberty. Gangsters who mess up get DP'd. You get three people that's gonna hit you for three minutes. It's from down to the head to the body. A second violation means twice the discipline. So you gotta make sure you don't do it again because when you do the second time, you're gonna get six minutes. The third time, you're gonna get suspension. You ain't gonna be no treat no more. Chapters hold regular meetings where they collect dues and conduct business. The money that we collect in every meeting is just in case you get locked up, we can send you money to jail. Once a year, Trinitarios from all over New York and New Jersey meet for a universal. We have the universal so everybody could come down and be a part of what's going on. New York Trinitarios, older and more experienced than their suburban brothers, still call the shots. I would say New York probably has more of an influence on Jersey uh, and probably tells them what to do, or what to say, or how to act if they don't like what they're seeing or hearing. That's what happened in August 2003 at the Dominican Day Parade in New Jersey. The New York Trinitarios discovered that their Jersey brothers had been attacked and issued their secret call to arms. 227 is 27. It means you go to war. The numbers are a code for February 27th, 1844. The day the Dominican Republic declared independence from its Haitian rulers. In Hudson County, it would signify that all hell was about to break loose. As soon as somebody said 227, my people gonna come. And they're gonna come ready. August 24th, 2003, Hudson County. It was New Jersey's annual Dominican Day Parade. From a rooftop, Detective Davis Valdivia videotaped the crowd on the lookout for gang violence. I was up there for several hours. Uh, I would say probably six hours on that roof. Little did he know that the bloodthirsty Dominican street gang, the Trinitarios, was out for revenge. Four months earlier, a 60th Street Gang member had stabbed a New Jersey Trinitario. The victim recovered, but the Trinitarios had yet to settle the score. An unacceptable situation for their New York brothers. They were upset that one of their members was stabbed and nothing was done about it. If someone messes with one of their members and it goes unpunished, they will essentially be viewed as chumps. The New York Trinitarios were hell-bent on revenge and planned to get it on their opponent's own turf. They strategized their attack at a local schoolyard late that afternoon. At the suggestion of a New York leader, they traded their traditional machetes for screwdrivers. It was easy at the moment because the guy from Brooklyn was like, oh no, we're not gonna carry none of that. What if we get stopped by the cop? They see us with screwdrivers in the car. They're not gonna bother us with that. They sharpened the tips for good measure. They armed themselves with those screwdrivers, ripped the clothing apart that were rags in the trunk of the car and wrapped it around the handle. If there's cloth on the handle, 
your hand won't slip when you stab someone with it. And you're never going to leave fingerprints. The gang was prepared for cold-blooded murder. You can't really slice anybody with a screwdriver. I mean, it's only one purpose is to, to uh, jab and uh, puncture. Two carloads of Trinitarios headed straight for the heart of the 60th Street Boys territory in West New York. They found what they were looking for at the corner gas station at 60th Street and Broadway. The Trinitarios confronted 21-year-old Jameer Brown, who was an associate of the gang. Once they approached him, they asked for an individual by the name of Monchi. That's the same individual that had words with them during the parade. Munchi was nowhere in sight, but Brown stood up for his friend to the bloodthirsty mob. He uh, responds uh, to them saying, he's not here, and if you have a problem with him, you have a problem with me. The Trinitarios pulled out their screwdrivers. Someone ran up to him and stabbed him. And then they were all over him, stabbing him. Brown went down instantly. One of his friends, a 16-year-old, tried to break up the assault. One individual of the Sixer Street Boys actually went to his aid, and he wound up getting stabbed in the forearm. Jameer's friend was able to escape and ran to alert police. He suffered a severe stab wound and would later need 19 stitches, but he survived the attack. Jameer Brown was not so lucky. The screwdrivers had ripped through a crucial artery. The Trinitarios scattered, leaving Jameer Brown essentially dying on, on the street. Brown died at a local hospital 90 minutes later. The murder sent a clear message from the Trinitarios to its many rivals. Do something to one of my people. I want to do something to you. If that's what we gotta do, to be known, so we can get our respect. If you mess with one of them, you're gonna mess with all of them. He'd also sent a message to New Jersey police, who finally realized the Trinitarios were in their own backyard. That was the first time that I actually uh, heard of Trinitarios. After the parade is when I really learned about the Trinitarios. And since that day, uh, things made a lot more sense to me. New Jersey PD immediately started hunting down the attackers and managed to catch three of them that night. By morning, Detective Valdivia was already interrogating one of the suspects, Trinitario Alex Colon. He showed Cologne surveillance video of the parade. He sat there, viewed the, the videotape, and, and I recall him pointing to the individuals that I zoomed in on. He would say, that's so one of them, and that's so-and-so. He was there, and he was in the car, and he just went on and on. On November 25th, 2003, police in New York City and Hudson County made five more arrests. A sixth suspect was arrested a few weeks later. Two more were in custody by March 2004. The charges included murder, aggravated assault, and a lawful possession of weapon. Among those charged were two alleged high-ranking Trinitario leaders, 22-year-old Ricardo Osorio of New York, and 21-year-old Pablo Molina of New Jersey. The prosecution's case was coming together. I counted about 56 witnesses that were possibly going to testify if needed. Prosecutors also had a star witness, Alex Colon, the gangster who identified suspects on the parade videotape, was in jail facing a murder charge. He was cooperating with the prosecution against the Trinitarios in the hopes of receiving a reduced sentence. Cologne gave us 
a nice big picture. He could point to all the parties. But Cologne would never make it to the stand. Our case seemed as if it would fall apart. Hudson County, New Jersey, 2004. Police there were carefully building a case against the Trinitarios, who had repeatedly stabbed and killed 21-year-old Jameer Brown. Screwdrivers, a lot of which were described as scary and old and rusty. It, it, it was a pretty brutal attack. Eight defendants were set to stand trial. One of them, 23-year-old Alex Cologne, was cooperating with police. He provided quite a bit of information. The case looked solid until January 2005. Cologne was killed by a fellow inmate in jail. No one could prove that Trinitarios had murdered Cologne to keep his mouth shut. And the prosecution was now in big trouble. Their star witness was dead. And other witnesses were terrified they might be next. They wouldn't speak to us. The state was now scrambling to rebuild its case. So we had to start putting a whole different case together. And now, this was now a patchwork of witnesses. January 5th, 2006. The first Trinitario defendant, one of the alleged New York leaders, Ricardo Osorio, went on trial. 18 days later, the jury convicted him of conspiracy to commit homicide. In May, the second defendant, Ramon Almonte, also went on trial. This time, Detective Davis Valdivia, who had taped the Dominican Day Parade where the fight began, took the stand as an expert witness. I was able to show motive. I was able to show uh, why they would respond the way they did. Almonte was also found guilty of conspiracy to commit homicide. He and Osorio received sentences of up to 20 years in prison. The five other defendants, including Pablo Molina, one of the alleged New Jersey leaders, fled out before their trials began. The convictions dealt a major blow to the gang. I like to think that what we did here discouraged the Trinitarius and disrupted what they intended to do, which was begin a network in New Jersey. But today, the Trinitarios show little sign of slowing down. In March 2009, Manhattan authorities made a huge bust in Washington Heights. 41 alleged Trinitarios were indicted on charges from drug distribution to weapons possession. They had blocks and blocks of um, narcotics in every corner selling them. If you wasn't a Trini, you wasn't going to sell a drug in New York. That's how they was doing it. Since the shakedown, law enforcement on 